Let's take a look at this. Let's remember what it's all about. Let's zero in on the God behind the gift of hope that was born 2,000 years ago and be reminded that in spite of all that our culture tells us that Christmas is, it is really about so much more. And I would say the catchphrase today is, this is Christmas. Would you say it with me? This is Christmas. Isaiah 9. The prophet Isaiah writes 2,700 years ago, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. It goes on in verse 2, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Verse 5, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fueled for the fire. In other words, they'll be gone. Verse 6, you know it. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. and He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And I would say, church, on December 3rd, this is Christmas. The prophet Isaiah wrote these words of hope more than, or about 700 years before the birth of Jesus. 700 years before the Bethlehem sky was filled with the light of a great star and the voices of angels proclaimed good news to shepherds in the fields who were watching their sheep by night. And they proclaimed God's, for, Isaiah proclaimed God's foretelling word through the prophet. God said, there is a coming king. There is hope for oppressed people. Verse 6 is probably the most familiar verse of the seven that we read. We, we know it. We, the essence of it we hear through praise and worship songs. and Even here at Calvary, all throughout the year, 52 weeks, 52 Sundays a year. But we'll hear it throughout the carols this time of year. The songs of Messiah. I think of Handel's Messiah. Are you with me? Wonderful counselor, right? We know the song. But again, here it is. And he will be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's no wonder at all that Isaiah's words in verse 6 permeate the month of December, what we call the holiday season leading up to Christmas, the commemoration of Christ's birth. Why? Because no one in all of history has ever so clearly fulfilled this prophecy as acutely as the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. Each name in this verse is a declaration of hope. I hope you'll hold on to them today. They describe a coming king who will save the day. A great king. A just king. A righteous king. He will rule on David's throne, bringing never-ending peace. Amen? So this morning, we want to take a few minutes to consider this description of this child to be born in a manger as described 2,700 years ago, still relevant today. This is Christmas. Wonderful. What comes to mind when we hear the word wonderful, when we think of someone or something that is wonderful, we think of something that is awesome, something that is amazing, something that is above and beyond the average ordinary. This is the word, the first word that Isaiah uses to describe the one that would be born in a manger. Wonderful. Now, uh, the root word in Hebrew is pele. So if you are any soccer fans in the house... So if you're a soccer fan, you, you would naturally think of the exceptional Pele, the Brazilian soccer player. No one was like him. Probably no one's ever been as good as him. He was amazing. The things he would do on the field was exceptional, right? A cut above. Amazing, inspiring, MVP material. That's kind of the lingo that the prophet Isaiah is using when he describes this soon coming Savior. Pele, Psalm 78 God did Pele, wonders in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt. So other translations referring to the time the, the Hebrews were in, in Egypt, 
The NIV says he did miracles. He did, King James, marvelous things. Our God, our Savior, is Pele. He is wonderful. God is a marvelous miracle worker. He does wonderful things that are almost beyond understanding and are certainly beyond mere human ability. Amen? Pele is also used in Judges 13 where it means incomprehensible or beyond understanding in reference to God and his name. The scenario there in verses 17, 17 and 18, uh, the, the soon-to-be mother of Samson was given a word from the Lord that she would give birth to this child, and there were some uh, promises and some predictions that she was wowed by, and she told her, her husband, Manoah, about this good word, and, and he just couldn't believe it, and he said, man, I wish I could have heard that. What am I, chopped liver? Why didn't the angel come talk to me? And so when the angel reappeared to Samson's uh, soon-to-be mother, uh, she did what any good mother would do, and she went and found her husband and said, hey, you got to get in on this because we got to be yoked together in trusting the Lord. So Manoah has this encounter with the Lord, the angel of the Lord, and, and he asks some questions. I love his heart, and he says this in verse 17, to the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? Now, if I can just pause there for just a half a second, right? What a great spirit of honor. I, I want to I be like that. In that moment, that slice of Manoah's interaction with and before God, God, I, I want to know who you are because I trust so much that your word will and your promises will be true. Yes and amen. And when and as they are, I want to be positioned to know you so that I can honor you. What a great motto to live by. So he asked this question. Verse 18, the angel of the Lord replied, and he said, Why do you ask my name? And he uses this word. It is beyond understanding. Pele is used throughout the scripture in reference to the wonder of God. So there's no doubt that when Isaiah calls this promised child Pele, he is referencing the divine. This child would be God himself. In fact, the coming of the child would be the greatest wonder of all wonders. God's greatest miraculous act of salvation. And church, I remind you, this is Christmas. Wonderful. Pele, counselor. Isaiah 11, 2, speaking of the new king that would arise from King David's father, Jesse, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel, there it is, and of might. He's the great counselor. Micah 4, another verse, verse 9, links the word counselor with the king. Now, we can all think of a good counselor, right? We all appreciate good and wise and godly counsel. And so you go to someone, why? Why? For, for advice. You, you go to someone because you, can, you, you need a little help because you can be somewhat confined in your perspective and you're hoping that they'll give you an alternative option, a bigger picture, a higher view, and maybe so that you can see others and see yourself in light of what God is doing in the greater grand scheme of things. And honoring God, loving God, honoring others. So you go to a counselor and you say, help me see this more clearly. Counselor could be a gift from God. Many a good dollar have been uh, spent on a good and godly counselor. We thank God for them, but note this. As we think about our Savior, as we think about Messiah, as we think about the, the boy child, Isaiah references uh, this baby, our Savior Jesus, as a wonderful counselor and a king. And this king, this child, will be the most wonderful counselor ever. Most kings surround themselves with a, with a court, an advisory committee, any leader, any CEO, uh, even a pastor has a, has a board of elders. There's, you know, there's, there's accountability, there's encouragement because we always don't see things real clear and we need others to kind of pray us through and help us kind of consider different angles. You have your staff, you have your team, you have your ministry teams, people at work. You understand the principle behind a court and a, and a king but the word of the Lord through Isaiah declares that this king will be unlike any other king. This king will be the king. This king will be the wonderful counselor with no need for an advisory committee. He's able within himself to know what is right and to make right decisions without needing to seek counsel anywhere else. 
from anyone else. Later on in this this book, Isaiah continues to ascribe such wise counsel to God and God alone. Isaiah 28, 29. Inspired by God, Isaiah is prophesying and predicting that a new king was coming. And in proclaiming that the child would be wonderful counselor, Isaiah was saying the unthinkable. That this child would be perfect in wisdom, perfect in knowledge, and be able to perfectly lead and guide his people with perfect justice, perfect truth, because this child would be divine. Wonderful counselor. Folks, this is Christmas. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. When someone is described as mighty, you probably think some of the same things that I think. I think strong, I think strength, I think capable. The Hebrew root word here is gibor, meaning, check this, hero. A doer of great things, of mighty acts done for someone else that they could not do for themselves. Mighty God. Hero status. Like a brave soldier in the trenches, penetrating the the line of the defense. Like a team captain, setting the pace for his team to victory. Like the brave manager who stands up to the CEO on behalf of fellow co-workers, or that union worker who represents so well, goes the extra mile. Biblically, I think of heroes like Moses facing Pharaoh and leading the people out of Egypt. I think of heroes in Scripture like Joshua taking on the walls of Jericho, heading toward the promised land. I think of young David when, when he took on Goliath, who had dominated over the armies of King Saul for so many years, and slaying that giant was a mighty act, a heroic act of salvation for the people of God at that time. And Isaiah, with Christ the Savior in mind, still yet years and centuries away, he makes the proclamation about your Savior in mind that he will be mighty, heroic, and he is God. Let's not forget this. This child, Isaiah declares, will be God. El, the most simplest uh, word in Hebrew used to refer to God, meaning One true God, the creator of all, supreme ruler over everything. It's used often in conjunction with other words to give God a variety of more specific names, such as El Shaddai, which is used 48 times in Scripture, or Lord God Almighty. It is never, El is never used to describe a man. In fact, it's often used to oppose and contradict and show the gap that exists between man and his God, El. Here it's combined, Isaiah combines El with Gabor, mighty God, or hero God, supreme ruler, to save the day. Isaiah is describing him as a hero who is far more than Moses or Joshua or David or Daniel. He's calling him a divine hero, a God who does heroic acts. This is the God of salvation Isaiah says in 1021, just a chapter and a half later, when talking about Israel, a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the, here's that word, mighty God. You think of Christ. Think of the New Testament. Think of the Gospels. Think of the historical accounts of this child who would then uh, grow and and be a miracle worker, a, a, a mercy, minister of mercy and grace. He would heal the blind, the lame, the sick, Think of Christ raising Jairus' daughter, appearing at the funeral of Lazarus three days late, if you will, and calling him forth very much alive. Think of Christ rising triumphantly from the grave, victorious over sin and death. Is there a greater hero than the Lord Jesus Christ? He is El Gabor, mighty God. And folks, I would say, this is, is Christmas. He is everlasting. He lasts forever. He has no end. This is who we follow. This is who we trust. This is who we serve. He's got no quit. He is forever faithful. He is forever reliable. Isaiah 57 says that he lives forever. 
He who lives forever, whose name is holy. Literally, it means that he lives in the forever. He inhabits eternity. He's not caught up in or restricted to time frames and eras. There is no technological advance that is advanced beyond our Lord. It's hard to get our brains around it. Therefore, he doesn't change. He doesn't get older or slower or more frail. Nor does he need to mature or grow or learn or become more wise. He is who he is, and he is that way, and he will be forever. Isaiah says that the promised boy child is everlasting. I find that astounding. A child born, a child, a baby, born into the world, yet called and named everlasting. His child will not come into existence when he is born, for he is everlasting. He has no beginning he has no end. Could Isaiah any more plainly declare that this child, the Christ child, is God incarnate? He is everlasting, and he is, as a child, father. Now, I think of a good father, and we could all imagine good fathers, the best of fathers. I mean, the father you wish you were, the father you wish you had, or the father you think you had, but he's better than all of that. Strength balanced with compassion and protection, faithful provision and guidance and support, appropriate encouragement, strong discipline, truth balanced with grace. Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Isaiah 63, verse 16 You, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. Throughout the pages of history, throughout the pages of Scripture, the Bible declares that God is our Father who art in heaven. Isaiah's prophecy boldly links these two names. Everlasting Father. In relation to this promised child saying that he is forever a father to his people. He is everlasting Father in church, I would say. Let's not forget. This is Christmas. And then Isaiah puts an emphatic exclamation mark on this list and lineage of names. He is the Prince of Peace. Everyone longs for peace. Remember, he was originally speaking to people who were at war, whose king was not handling the situation very well, People of God were under threat, both from the enemy nations and from King Ahaz, who wasn't the most godly leader. And that's why at the end of Isaiah 8, the preceding chapter, Isaiah shows us that God's people at this point in time, and maybe you can relate, they were in a tough spot. He says this, see, they, only see, they see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. It's a tough spot. Maybe that's something you can relate with. Maybe life kind of has you in that place. Maybe you're kind of feeling like, man, it's a dark place. It's a dark season, and, and you feel gloomy. <laughs> Good news today. Christmas came <laughs> to change all of that. And then God makes a promise that they will see a great light, that their warfare will end, because unto us a child is born. And his name will be Prince of Peace. Jesus said it so clearly in John 14, 27. I love these words. Maybe you need to hear them today. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. He goes on to say, don't be troubled. The Messiah my Savior and hopefully yours is the Prince of Peace because his kingdom will be one of peace. It won't be established by fighting a war, but by bridging a gap caused by sin. His peace, it won't be maintained by keeping an army to prevent enemies from attacking. His kingdom will uphold peace with arms of amazing grace and sacrificial love. Do you remember what Jesus said to Pilate? John eighteen thirty six. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. 
He goes on, but now my kingdom is from another place. It's different. It's distinct. It's contrary to human nature. He is the prince of peace. Because the cause of war, human sinfulness, and rebellion against God will be dealt with by this wonderful, beautiful prince. Later in Isaiah 53, we read about what we celebrated through communion earlier. We read about what would happen at the end of the Messiah, the King, the Christ child, the boy who was born in the manger. We read about the end of his life, and Isaiah, some 700 years prior, not only predicts the birth of Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem, but he predicts his sacrificial saving grace on a cross. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. His wounds will heal our greatest hurts. Amen? The end result of all of this, Christ's sacrifice, our peace. This is Christmas. So, friends, it's our faith and our trust in Jesus that makes all the difference. Forgiveness of our sin and he removes our remorse and its consequences. And then there's peace. A peace that passes all understanding. Have you experienced it? Do you know it? Because until you know him, until you've looked at him and placed your faith in him, all of this is script on a page. It's the appropriate message in December. But he wants it to be so much more personal for you and for me. Will you allow this Christmas to be personal? When this proclamation was made 2,700 years ago, those people who were suffering much that Isaiah spoke this truth and offered this hope to, this was a cause for hope and celebration to them. Listen, 700 years before Christmas, now you remember when you were a child and you couldn't wait for Christmas because it was like a week away? You remember? Christmas for those Israelites was 700 years away. And they went through a lot, but there was a remnant of them that kept the faith. And they kept looking, and they kept waiting, not for Santa to come down a chimney, but for a baby to be born king. This is Christmas. So for us, we may have three weeks or so, I don't know, whatever it is, three, four weeks until Christmas, but because Christ was born in Bethlehem, listen, church, every day is Christmas. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Don't forget, this is Christmas. Would you stand with me and pray? Listen, over the next three weeks, I want you to pray with me and ask the Lord to reveal himself for the reality that he is like never before. That you'll savor him in your hearts like never before. That you'll place your faith in him if you haven't. You'll trust him to forgive you of your sins, to be your leader and to be your savior, to be your Lord. Lord of all. And then would you pray for those around you, those in our community that don't yet know the true meaning of Christmas? They don't know that this is Christmas. They think it's all the other stuff. And would you pray for them? And would you look for opportunities to represent to them the true meaning, the Christ in Christmas? And will you ask God with me here as we pray to give you a quickening by his Holy Spirit to recognize moments, people, conversations, texts and emails, invitations that you can give to showcase the reality of Emmanuel, Christ with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pause today, and I do anyway. God, I, I pause astounded, amazed again at the reality of your master plan to save me, to save sinners, to offer mankind hope. 
Lord, I pray for every one of us today, God, that it would be our prayer, Lord, that, that we'd place our faith and our trust in this gift of God, God's Son, Jesus Christ. That, Jesus, we would see you for who you really are. You are wonderful. Far beyond our greatest imagination, you are the best counselor ever. You're mighty. You're strong. You're, you're bigger and badder than everything that life and the enemy can throw our way. And you are the one true living God. You are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the perfect Father. And God, when we look to you, Jesus, when we place our faith in you and you forgive our sin, we find that you are the Prince of Peace. Help us today, God. Place our faith in you, to call on you, to invite you to be all of those things to us personally. If that's you, friend, just ask him. Say, Lord, I know you came for a reason. You came to save me from my sin and its consequences. I admit I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I place my faith in you. I believe you are the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. No one else could do so like you have. Forgive me. Save me. Lead me from this point forward. And again, Lord, we pray for family and friends and community at large, people in our schools, our friends, and people at work, our neighbors, and people that think Christmas is all this other stuff. And God, as you're, you're, you're stirring our spirits and our minds the beginning of this Christmas season here as Calvary Assembly of God, Lord, would you, again, we ask, would you move in and through our community, our families, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, Lord, would you stir their hearts, open their eyes to see the reality of Christ, God's most amazing gift. And God, we surrender ourselves to your plan. We dare to ask you to use us this Christmas season to represent the truth that is Christ, Emmanuel. Holy Spirit, give us the words to speak to people. Show us who to invite perhaps to church or youth group or to Christmas celebration so that others too can consider, contemplate, and then make a commitment to the newborn king, Jesus. Pray all these things.